You know things are about to get serious in the market when this guy starts showing up in stock photos. Here's the truth about the market and investing. The truth is, the market does not care about the truth. It moves based on feelings. One of my best friends said something to me once in high school that I will never forget. I was trying to date someone who didn't want to be with me, and at the time I didn't understand why she didn't, but now it makes perfect sense. But he said to me, Andre, feelings are neither right nor wrong. They just are. And that's how the market moves. It moves because it does based on people's feelings, which are neither right or wrong. They just are. Now, no one can predict what's going to happen to the market, but we can look at what's going on around the world and say with some degree of certainty that based on how investors feel, which is concerned about the market's future, it's starting to look shaky. And that's affecting the crypto markets too, but we'll talk about that later. But the reason this is all so important is because the memes. How could we forget? Like this one, which shows Papa Powell showing G how to crank the money printer. So obvious in hindsight. Or this one which shows millennials in real time reacting to Evergrande, thinking it'll crash the market and we can buy affordable housing. But other than the memes, this is important because if you watch this video all the way through, hopefully it gives you the knowledge not to panic and sell your investments at the wrong time because obviously you've smashed the like button and subscribed to my channel. So in today's video, I'll show you exactly what's going on, why investors are saying it's gonna go from bad to worse, and how you can take advantage of this opportunity by buying the dip, and I'll show you what I'm buying, so let's begin. Hi, my name is Andre Jick. Hope you're doing well. Come for the finance and stay for Starbucks's new coffee cup, the Evergrande, where the drink you get is already overflowing with coffee and they've misspelled your name. Thank you, thank you. Late night show comedy format does not work for YouTube. So this week, the market took a huge nosedive because of Evergrande. Now, I know you've heard this story before a million times. You've read it, you've seen it on the news, you understand it, but I'm gonna go deep in this video because Evergrande, not Evergrande, not Evergrande, not a big nolly. Evergrande, one of China's biggest real estate developers, is so big that some people are calling them the Chinese Lehman Brothers. Now, this is scaring the markets because if you remember back in 2008, when the Lehman Brothers collapsed, it helped trigger the 2008 global financial crisis. And so the internet is afraid that if these guys are as big as Lehman Brothers, then maybe their collapse could trigger the next global crisis. So let's talk about real estate just to give us some context because here in the US, home ownership rates are about 65.4%. But in China, that home ownership rate is over 90%. This is because it is very culturally and socially significant to own a house. It is so important to people that the debt to income ratios don't even sound real. I looked at the top 10 cities and the debt to income ratio starts at 18. That's on the low end and it goes as high as 49 in Beijing. This means that people are borrowing up to 49 times their annual income. Now, just for context, here in the US, our average is about four times what we make in a year. But in China, the average is about 27. So you could see how by those numbers, it can be very profitable to be a real estate developer in China. Enter Evergrande. Evergrande has grown to become the second biggest real estate developer in China with over 1300 projects spanning 280 cities. This company is so big, it's bigger than the amount of cities I knew existed in China. And how they got there was through debt because they owe $300 billion, which accounts for roughly 2% of China's national GDP, which doesn't sound like a lot until you realize that real estate makes up about 29% of their total GDP, which is a big deal. Knowing just how important real estate is to the Chinese economy is how Evergrande was able to create a perfect money printing plan. Step one, build and pre-sell expensive homes and apartments at overly inflated appraisal values for maximum profit. Step two, use the profit we made from selling very expensive homes at overly appraised values to build even more, Lambus bread. Step three, before we finish building the current project, start the pre-sale of the next one at overly appraised values for even more profit. And then step four, profit. Now, if at any point they run out of money, all they have to do is issue some bonds and then pay people interest for holding them, which is how they're able to raise more money. And it's also how they ended up in the situation where they owe everyone in the world some money, from individuals to banks, corporations, hedge funds. They probably owe us money right now. Let's give them a call. Hi, I'm calling about extending your warranty on my bond insurance. Now the strategy works really well as long as the supply chain is running and there's demand. But we all know 2019 happened and it put a stop to everything. Now this next part is gonna blow your mind because Evergrande owes 
1.6 million apartments to people have put down a cash deposit. And for the people that own their interest generating real estate products, they're offering them actual apartments at up to 50% discount instead of those interest payments. And unfortunately for their employees, they're offering them an ultimatum. They're saying either lend our company money or lose your yearly bonus. And this has forced some people to go as far as going to borrow money from the bank just to lend to Evergrande. And so the big question is, can Evergrande survive and pay their bills? Because if they can't, the worry is that it could trigger the next financial crisis. So let me just see if I can answer this question in the next section and share with you what I know so far. It's about to get a little bit nerdy because I'm about to do a little bit of math, but I promise it's very simple to follow along. And what I'm gonna try to do is look at the debt held by some of these bondholders. And this is important because these bondholders, remember, are companies that bought bonds, aka they lent money to Evergrande and they depend on the income from Evergrande. How dependent are they and how big is their exposure? Because if we find out that Evergrande were to fail, how bad would it be for these companies? Again, this is not complete data, but this is what I was able to find. This is the top four bondholders of Evergrande. So coming in at number one is Ashmore Group at $433.1 million worth of bonds. They're a money management company out of London. There's also BlackRock with $385 million of bonds. BlackRock is a huge hedge fund that owns pretty much anything and everything. Then there's UBS Group at $275.7 million, and then HSBC with roughly $207 million. Now let's do some math and see if those companies are independent companies that don't need no grand, or if they need Evergrande to remain ever grand. <laughs> no autographs. So Ashmore Group right here has an AUM of $86 billion. By the way, AUM stands for Assets Under Management. So they have $433 million worth of bonds, which represents only half a percent worth of their holdings. But then we have BlackRock with $9.5 trillion worth of an AUM and $385 million worth of bonds from Evergrande, which is only 0.004% of their holdings. Then we have UBS Group, which has about 2.6 trillion and $275 million worth of bonds, which is about 0.01% of their holdings. And then we have HSBC with 621 billion AUM and only 0.04% exposure. Andre. What does this mean? This means that I was right in the beginning of the video when I said the market moves in ways that's based on emotion, the narrative, and the stories that were told. Because think about it, how does a stock like BlackRock lose over 6% of its value in just a few days when their exposure to Evergrande is only 0 0.004? That would make sense if their exposure was closer to 6%, but it's nowhere near that level. And that's true for all these other companies which have less than half a percent exposure. This means that none of these companies depend on Evergrande for income or anything else, which means if Evergrande was to fail, that would be very unfortunate for people living in China because that would affect over 90% of people's real estate portfolios. But for people living outside of China, none of this should make a difference. Now, of course, all of this is based on my limited mathematical interpretation. And there are things I don't know that I don't know about. But as far as what we do know and the info we have, this should make a lot of sense. But if you're still somebody who believes that the world is gonna fall apart, there's one more thing I wanna show you to convince you that it's not. This is from Barron's, by the way, which is an incredible subscription service. If you're a money nerd like me, it's worth it. I'm not sponsored by them, but I wish I was. So in this article, they talked about something called the Credit Default Swap Index. Now, if that word sounds really familiar, it's because you've probably heard about it since 2008 when everyone was talking about it. Credit default swaps are sort of like insurances that companies can take out to protect their investments. So if I'm a company like BlackRock and I'm a bag holder, sorry, a bond holder of Evergrande's bonds, AKA assets that promise to pay me interest, in this case from Evergrande, I might say to myself, wait a minute, these guys are in trouble. I don't know if they'll be able to afford to pay me the interest. I wanna protect my investments. I might wanna buy a credit default swap. And the reason that these credit default swaps are important is because it's the equivalent of a company taking out a life insurance policy. And if we notice that a lot of these companies start doing that, it should make us worried about what these guys know that we don't know about that they have to take out a life insurance policy. So let me show you this index and see if that's really the case. On September 20th right here, you can see this chart jumps up like crazy. This means the price of these default swaps is going up. Normally, this is a concern, 
but it's not actually a concern until the price hits about 50. So far though, we can see on Tuesday, it starts to level off. Does any of this make sense? I hope it makes sense, but it seems so complicated and I feel like I've lost people, but if this doesn't make sense, in a nutshell, this graph shows that companies have stopped buying up life insurance. And if they were buying it, the price would go up, which would be scary. But we're seeing the opposite, which means everything should be fine. But unfortunately, that's just not how markets work. And because the stock market feels scared, some people are selling off or waiting on the sidelines to see what else happens. That's the stock market. That's the real data that we know. But now let's talk about crypto because there's a new rumor that appears and that's the rumor between Evergrande and Tether. As soon as Evergrande started to happen, people in crypto do what they do best, spread fear, uncertainty, and doubt that Tether, the stablecoin that's supposed to be backed by assets, held a significant amount of Evergrande's bonds. And if you think about it, if Evergrande's bonds become worthless, or at least worth less, then Tether, the coin that's supposed to be backed by $1 or $1 worth of an asset for every dollar they create, could be in a lot of trouble. This just in, Tether has now started issuing interest payments in the form of really discounted real estate. Nothing to see here. Everything is just fine. I'm just kidding, don't sell your Bitcoin or do so I can buy it really cheap. Now Tether has stated that they do not own any Evergrande bonds, but time will tell if that's actually true. But in the meantime, here are my personal thoughts about everything that's going on. Personally, I believe this is completely overblown and when the media tells us that there's a boogeyman around the corner, I don't buy that because the numbers don't support that conclusion considering what we know today, unless of course we find out something new. The real risk is for the people living in China. And I'm crossing my fingers and I'm hoping they get through this because it'd be a shame to let the market collapse. On one hand, if the government lets Evergrande collapse, that could affect as many as 90% of citizens living in China, and it could affect a ton of the real estate market, which is bad. And the incentive that the government might have to do something like that is just to make an example that extreme capitalism is bad and leverage and debt are all concepts that are really not good, right? On the other hand though, if they do step in, if they do save Evergrande, that could signal to the market that, hey, extreme leverage is totally fine. And we should continue getting ourselves into more debt, making real estate even more unaffordable, as long as corporations are making billions and billions of dollars. So in the meantime, while everyone is panicking about what's going on, I've been buying the dip, and here's what I'm buying. I put in a buy order of Ethereum at roughly $2,718. So I bought the dip. I also bought some stocks, but mostly index funds. Now I don't try to time the stock market because I believe it's a lot more efficient than crypto. And by this, I mean, there's a lot more sophisticated investors and bourgeoisie, like the hedge funds, the corporations that have a lot more insider data and information faster than you and I will ever get. And for that reason, it's hard to take advantage of that opportunity and find those good deals. But the crypto market is a lot more inefficient. And this is because many retail investors invest in crypto. And we are a lot more susceptible to things like fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And there's a lot more opportunity. Now, this does not necessarily apply to everyone, especially if you're nearing retirement, because crypto is at minimum a 10-year investment plan. And if you have time on your side, like I do, because I'm only 75, then I think you'll make more money in the long run. And I'll be telling everyone I'm millennial money, I told you so. But in the meantime, as more corporations and sophisticated investors like hedge funds join the industry, as the speed of information and accuracy spreads faster on social media, opportunities like this will become less frequent and less volatile over time because markets will become more efficient. But while they're inefficient, I'm buying everything, <laughs> but mostly Ethereum. If you're interested in my investing journey, the moment that I buy or sell any of my investments, you can join my Patreon and I'll let you know the moment that I buy or sell anything. This is not a pitch to make money. You're not gonna make money. This is not about that. This is just about my investing journey because I did buy Coinbase when they IPO'd and I lost a lot of money. So there's, there's no promises there, but you do get access to a cool tool that allows you to track your investments. And again, that is my Patreon link down below. In the meantime, don't forget to have a great rest of your day. Smash the like button, subscribe if you haven't already. Go get up to $250 worth of free Bitcoin with this block by link right here. Go get those two free stonks with Webull. Go track them automatically. Spreadsheet link down below in my Patreon. Love you. Thank you so much for watching this video. I will see you back here on Monday, Friday, sometimes Wednesday, as always. Would love Love to hear your thoughts about what's going on. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.